From New York City, for our viewers worldwide, I'm Manish Cranny in for Jonathan Farrow. So the equity markets grappled with a spike in yields at twos and tens. Short end of the curve shreds the rate cut probability here in the United States to less than 50 basis points for 2024. The impact on stocks, we spend the next hour counting it down to the market open. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up on the show, U.S. inflation comes in hot for a third consecutive month. That sends stocks sharply lower and yields spiking higher across the curve. Traders slash the rate outlook for 2024. We begin with that issue. Another surprise to the upside for CPI. The sound that you heard there was the door slamming on a June rate cut. It's, uh, that's gone, uh, I think. Uh, the problem is the Federal Reserve, and particularly Jay Powell, wants to achieve consensus. He's not going to be able to get consensus around a June rate cut. I don't know, you know if he'd even want to push one at this stage. It's definitely more inflation than the Fed wants. Let's get straight to the numbers. Mike McKee is with us in Washington, D.C. So, Mike, this pervasive, sticky inflation, it's broad. It is. Uh, and the Fed is not going to be happy with this. They've been looking for more confidence that inflation would keep going down. Instead, it has stalled out. We see on a rounded basis, if you look uh, at, at the three-digit numbers, they were in the threes, but they round up to four-tenths for both the headline and the core on the month. And that pushes up the year-over-year -year numbers as well. Not something that you wanted to see if you're the Fed and you're maybe talking about uh, rate cuts sometimes soon. That does seem to be off the table. If you take a look at what it was that put us here, it's uh, according to our ECAN breakdown, it is services. Services continue to be the biggest thing that are affecting the overall e inflation rate. Uh, a little bit of energy price uh, rises. We saw some medical care services and we saw motor vehicle insurance rise. All of those, except for the energy, fall under the services category, and that's why we are still having such a big problem. Now, if you uh, want to see what that means overall, uh, we take a look at uh, the, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, the numbers <laughs> that uh, show housing there. Housing is still at the same level it was, up uh, four-tenths for owner's equivalent rent. It went up to a half percent rise for rent of shelter. So housing is still a major contributor, and we're not seeing the progress that we thought we would see. And so it is a, a major issue for the Fed overall, and it isn't clear what they can do about that because the Fed stopped moving back in July of 2023, but inflation hasn't moved down really since. Well, certainly not what they want over at the Fed. Mike, thank you very much. Great breakdown there, Mike McKee in Washington. Uh, let's continue the conversation. My guests this morning are Robert Tipp of PGM and Matt Egan over at Loomis Sales. Gentlemen, good morning. Um, this is, to quote Mr. Kelly uh, just a few moments ago from JP Morgan Asset Manager, this, this is the sign of a door slamming shut on a June ray cut. So the consensus is going to build, isn't it, gents, towards less cuts and later. Is the door firmly shut now on a June cut? Robert, good morning. Yeah, I mean, I think that the Fed really doesn't have anything to do here. Uh, they have, you know, taken the Fed funds rate up to a level where growth has remained very firm. Inflation has come down a lot from 6% on core, 9% headline. Uh, we're down under 4% at this point on a year-over-year -year rate. But as we saw with the jobs number, uh, you can argue about what are the causes of the growth that we're having in the U.S., but generally speaking, growth is firm, financial conditions are easy, and the Fed doesn't really have anything to do. So I think the patience message uh, started to come out a little bit more clearly. They've been up and down on this over the last year, uh, sometimes, sometimes sounding a little bit impatient, like they wanted to start cutting rates to avoid a passive tightening of conditions. Uh, but I think there's pretty good reason for them to remain on hold here, see how things go. I will, you know, remind everybody, of course, 
prior to the most recent few months, we had six months of really good inflation prints that were down in the target zone. So this could be a fluke, uh, but it's a strong economy. Energy prices are up. It could be a while waiting for them to be in cutting rates. And then not much coming in terms of rate cuts once they get started, for all we know. Well, it is three misses in a row. I love the line on the MLive blog this morning. To underestimate one or two inflation prints may be misfortune. But to miss several in a row looks careless. Matt, good morning. This is not what the Fed want to see. And it emboldens the Waller Bostic narrative. Later and less, and perhaps a lot less than this market thinks. I mean, the short end and the long end are both virulent this morning, up 18 basis points uh, on, on, on the short end, uh, and indeed pressing higher on the long end as we speak. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I, to answer your uh, prior question, I do think it shuts the door on a June <clears throat> rate cut. And the question, I guess, now, are there going to be any rate cuts the rest of this year? You know, our overarching view has been that uh, because of some of the mega trends that your show has been talking about and others, um, that there are pressures for uh, that pushed us into an unstable inflationary regime. Uh, that means that you get more variability to the upside through the cycle, but you know, inflation itself is cyclical. We were of the view that inflation was on the downside. That was clearly evident. And then the question was, where is it going to bottom out? Uh, and for how long before it starts to hook back up again? And, you know, three data points in a row, you know, maybe that doesn't make it a trend, but, you know, you keep looking around, it's like whack-a-mole, something, you know, comes down, uh, one of the factors comes down, one of the uh, categories comes down on the inflation uh, data, and another one pops up. So, you know, this trend, it does seem like, you know, the, the danger here is we're bottoming out at this level, and then in some places even uh, hooking up again. So that's, that's the danger and you can see the effect it's having on the market. You know, interesting with, the, you know, people are wondering what was going to cause the risk trade to kind of falter. And, well, here you have it. You used the language there that it's about stability or instability. But this is just darn sticky inflation. And it's going to delay the capitulation of money market funds out of money market into risk assets, isn't it, Matt? That's right. We've all been watching the massive amount of money that's built up into the money market accounts. You know, not all of that was going to get redeployed uh, into the markets, but mm -hmm. there was this sort of wait uh, for, you know, a Fed rate cut to finally happen to kind of push that out the curve, pushing it back into the fixed income markets. And perhaps we're going to need to wait a little bit longer for that, that flow to materialize. No. Uh, of course, Robert, this to you. You talk about traversing. I, lo I love the language that you use, traversing uh, these new higher levels. Uh, uh, and that is a strategic buy zone. So I, I'm, I'm just working on the assumption that there must be a mountain of real money buyers ready to come in here. 494 on two year paper. You want to buy the short end. You had a nice spike in duration. These kind of virulent moments in markets, what opportunities do they present for duration hunters? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what we're seeing play out, and I uh, hinted at this in, in the paper we put out uh, last year, uh, High Plains Drifter, and uh, highlighted these money fund balances in the quarterly that we just put out, the second quarter outlook, money fund balances at 21% of GDP uh, is really elevated relative to normal levels. And these, uh, you know, are starting points for very firm markets. So that money, is it going to come out quickly? No. Um, but we have been seeing steady flows into the long-term markets, and uh, those are likely to continue. So is this a rough day for the market? It is. But yields are high, and I think that's why this yield curve is inverted, because investors are keeping long rates below short rates because they want to make absolutely sure that they lock in these returns for the long run, because eventually you're going to have lower short rates. So uh, I think uh, we're going to have to uh, adjust to this slower course. It's not going to take that much in terms of market movement. Uh, but then you're going to go back to earning these these high yields, which I don't think is, uh, is a bad thing. And it's going to be a different bull market, not where the rates drop down immediately and you got a big pop in return and it's over, uh, but one where we stay up in this high range 
your high yield, your emerging markets, your investment grade corporate structured product, they earn these high yields for a very long period of time to come. And I, I, that is, I like know. what you had to say in regards to, I mean, it has not been the year of the bond yet. Let's just <laughs> keep, keep that very squarely in our mind. But, you know, it has been a pretty good party in high yield. Uh, Robert, it has been a very good party in investment grade. I just wonder, I mean, I know we're having a dislocatory day and we probably will run into this bandwidth now. We'll trade four and a half, maybe we'll touch five. But we're, we're in a new band zone of trading in sovereigns. What does that do for the rest of the year for the party in high yield and for the investment grade, the tightening in spread there, Robert? Right. Well, you know, that was the case last year as well. Uh, there was no, uh, you know, money made in the market until you got to the end of the year, yields dropped, and it was a good year for bonds. Uh, in the first quarter of this year, long-term yields went up a bit, but high yield performed, EM performed the higher risk markets, posted positive returns. So this is a, a great backdrop in the sense that you're not looking at economic contraction. You're not looking at an economy that looks like it's cresting rapidly and with a lot of downside risk. It's looking like one that has solid growth that the Fed wants to take the edge off of. And that's a really good environment for credit. Uh, managements have been terrified by the pandemic, by SVB, by the higher interest rates, that there's going to be a recession, going to be a recession. Mm -hmm. As a bond investor, that is what you want. You want managements to be cautious and working for the bondholder uh, to maintain their credit quality, their access to markets. Uh, you don't want them to be overconfident in the investment backdrop, in the economic backdrop, and, and levering up. So uh, it, spreads are tighter. They have come in a lot. There's not a lot of room for wholesale tightening from here. Uh, but I think that these uh, incremental spreads uh, are, are likely to produce income and some further tightening. Uh, you know, over the long term here, it's going to be uh, a good backdrop for credit product, I believe. Matt, on days like this, lots of people who ha do not have the right exposure either to equity or indeed to bonds and to yield, they're going to welcome this spike, the spike in yields and the drop in, in equity. This print in CPI, what does it do to overall risk and risk management? What kind of conversations will be, people be having today? Well, uh, you know, I think it does represent an opportunity. I think you can, we've been advocating moving out the Treasury curve. I'd be curb your enthusiasm on the very longer end. I think, uh, you know, structural deficits in the United States and the amount of T bill, or the amount of bonds that have to come to the market and clear could be problematic for the longer end. Uh, but I do think the intermediate part of the curve represents decent value here to kind of push out your duration into that area. Um, and, you know, I think there's less risk, certainly, of a, of a Fed rate hike, so you can collect those higher yields. Um, and if we do indeed go through a normal cycle and we start some uh, sort of, you know, cutting uh, exercise by the Fed, you'll absorb that. I think there's less scope for the long end to come down, though, in this rate cycle, because I think it's going to be really, really shallow on the on the on the downside. Um, and we have to keep in mind, uh, you know, the long end, it's sort of like a bullwhip, right? So if yields move like they move today or, or, you know, with future concern about structural deficits in the United States, uh, that's going to crack. And that crack on the long end is going to be, you know, bond yields moving higher. So I, I'd be cautious on the long end, but that intermediate part is attractive. You know, you were mentioning spreads in the market. Mm -hmm. I felt this year... We had moved too far, you know, too tight in spreads in the corporate market. Um, you know, people were chasing and they were looking at just the absolute yield. But spreads, yeah. which is what you need to get paid for, you know, have contracted a lot. And I think we're not expecting a lot of losses to develop. We agree uh, with um, the notion that losses are going to remain low and fundamentals are pretty good. But you do want to get uh, sufficient risk premium to compensate in case you are wrong on that event. Indeed. And there's perhaps, there has, not, perhaps so. just not enough in, in the spreads there. It, you can be a coupon clipper, but perhaps not enough in the spreads to compensate. Right. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much for your first reaction. Shelter gasoline prices driving over half of the CPI bump to plus 0.4% on the headline and on the core. If you're just tuning in at 14 minutes past nine uh, this Wednesday morning. My guest, Robert Tip, Matt Egan there. Uh, the implications for the equity market, we have not had a 2% drawdown in these equity 
markets uh, for quite a long time. Uh, Nasdaq down 1.5%, S&P futures down 1.4%. So again, pre-market, we're looking uh, under the hood uh, to get some of those movers, a flavour of what's driving the growth-to-value narrative or the dissipation of that. Let's ask Abigail Doolittle. Yeah, and those losses on the S&P 500, if they hold on the day, Manus, will be the worst day since the end of January. This, of course, as fears that liquidity will not be coming back into the market as yields back up. The two-year yield nearly at 5%. Not surprisingly, big tech uh, really getting hit hard. Valuation fears uh, really at play here. Amazon.com down 1.9%. This stock up more than 80% over the last year. So too far, too fast narrative uh, coming into play. Fears around that, that the uh, good times may last. Tesla, on the other hand, not up over the last year, down 2%. Fears that the liquidity crunch uh, would maybe hit their business and create uh, even more difficulties for the path ahead in terms of growth. One stock that is climbing higher, Delta Airlines up 2.5%. They, of course, put up a good quarter. And the outlook for the year, uh, it is better than expected on a revival of business travel, Manus. There you go. Come fly the friendly skies. I don't think that was their tagline. Abigail, thank you very much. Uh, quick snapshot of what's going on in the bond markets. This is what matters to risk. This is a hot CPI uh, report. And we are now shredding the possibility of three rate cuts. We're down to two. And they may well be later and less. November from September. The bond market is not waiting for an additional print to take the losses. Right here on Bloomberg, 4.5% on tens. third consecutive month of hotter than expected inflation data, underscoring the challenges facing the Federal Reserve and providing a new headache for President Biden ahead of this year's looming election. Let's extend the conversation now with our very own Ender Kern, who joins me from Washington, D.C. I like what the blog team have written, which is this. They're, they're channeling their inner Ms. Havisham, Charles Dickens, uh, in 1861. To underestimate one or two inflation prints may be misfortune. But to miss several in a row looks like carelessness. I mean, the Fed, they certainly look as if their guidance is now perhaps misguided. This is not just a bump in the road. Two months of hotter CPI. We're now up to three in a row. Ender, good day. Good morning, man. It's not just a bump in the road. Yes, the usual suspects of gas and shelter are there. They made up about a half of the increase overall. But when you look into the details, prices are going up for furniture. They're going up for fixing your car. They're going up for buying clothes. They're going up for going to see the doctor. It's a fairly broad-based increase in inflation across the board. And it kind of pushes an art of beyond this idea that maybe there are one or two kind of shocks at the beginning of the year that people are willing to look through and attribute to idiosyncratic factors. The conversation before I come over here now, the reaction from analysts seems to be that there's a risk that inflation is actually accelerating again. And of course, that has big implications both for the Federal Reserve and potentially on the political side of things as well. OK, and, and certainly there's a virulent reaction in that bond market right the way across the curve. You've got twos and tens spiking higher. Uh, obviously, tens doing most of the work as there is uh, perhaps a little bit more concern about enduring inflation, up 13 basis points on tens uh, and twos, uh, up now 20 basis points, 21 basis points. We're down to 50 basis points for 2024. Rate cuts will be later and less than the market had anticipated. That's your bond market in a pretty virulent mood at the moment. The belly of the curve up 18 basis points. From the bond market to Boeing, more trouble. A former employee accusing the company of taking shortcuts during the production of the 787 Dreamliner aircraft this time, saying this. In a mad rush to reduce the backlog of planes and to get them to market, Boeing did not follow its own engineering requirements. The company pushing back, saying that the claims are, quote, inaccurate. Benny Camel joins me now for more. Benny, it's not to say this company was recovering from 737 MAX. There's a cap on what they can produce. But I want to know exactly what this whistleblower is claiming. Now that I'm about to step on a Dreamliner, or the next time I step on a Dreamliner, what should I be worried about? 
Well, that's exactly the problem, isn't it? That now in the public narrative, there is a sense that these planes are no longer safe. And this is a huge issue for Boeing. You know, for, for, for decades, uh, this, this company was the, the standard bearer of, of flying safe and producing great planes. And that narrative has really slipped since January 5th, where we had that blowout on the 737. And now, you just quoted him last night, this whistleblower came out, a Boeing engineer who's worked on the 787 program. And it's worth reminding people, these are very different the very different aircraft. The 737 is a plane that stems from the from the 60s, essentially the original design. The 787 is a sophisticated carbon fiber plane that was hatched at you know the start of the millennium. It's the most advanced aircraft, and um, it also means it's more complicated to put together. And that's where the allegations come in. This whistleblower saying that the way that uh, Boeing was putting these aircraft together, that they were fitting these single sections together, was done in a, in a clumsy, in a, in, a, in a sort of too rushed kind of way. Uh, they should have been slower. They should have pointed out uh, the, the gaps that might exist in these, in these barrel sections and so on. Um, and that's something it didn't do. They put speed over precision. They put profit over the the process and that really goes to the heart of the problem that's facing the company right now you know is this still a reliable manufacturer and that's a huge lot of work for the next CEO coming in indeed and the questions now arise as to whether uh, Calhoun can really uh, make it through to the end of the year as was suggested some serious issues which the company have denied it must be uh, expressly said that the company has responded Benny Carmel there uh, with the very latest on Boeing coming up your morning calls and that's uh, joined afterwards by Megan Horneman from Verdance Capital Advisors with me on this hotter than expected CPI print if you want to look at it in these terms uh, that core CPI up four tenths of one percent takes the three month annualized to 4.6 percent. This is Bloomberg. Few morning calls. Let's take a look at what the analysts are saying on Wall Street. First up, Truist downgrades deck is to hold, saying recent data points to slower sales growth. Next up, Morgan Stanley cuts Boeing's price target down to a street low, 180 bucks, expecting slower deliveries, longer oversight from the FAA. And finally, Argus downgrades Yum Brands to hold, warning of slower customer traffic, weakening menu prices. Coming up. We're going to talk to Verdant's Capital Advisors on the market implications of yet another hot CPI. At some point, there was going to be a pinch point. Today is that day. Spike in yields challenges the growth to value narrative, and it literally wipes out. Look at this. Russell Futures down 2.5%. These are markets that are grappling with Later rate cuts and less rate cuts. Now less than 50 basis points priced into this market for 2024. They may be clapping there. This could be a temporary reprieve. Don't forget, if you haven't got your allocation into stocks, maybe this drawdown is your opportunity. That is what you're going to see in your inbox as we go through the rest of the day. Now, it is critically important. The dollar is flying higher across all G10. But look at dollar yen. We talked about this red line in the sand for the Japanese, for the Bank of Japan and the Ministry of Finance at 152. We have busted through that. So it's going to be a fascinating 24 hours in terms of what BOJ does to that. Two-year yields up 18 basis points. This is a shredding of rate cuts uh, expectations for 2024. This emboldens the Bostic and Waller narrative and oil is up by four tenths of one percent as we have this uh, I suppose residual concern uh, about what happens on the geopolitical front as well as a strong economy one stock to watch at the opening it is Delta Airlines posting better than estimated results delivering upbeat outlook for the travel industry Abigail Doolittle is with me Abby I've only been in coach so far on Delta take me through what's it like at the front 
Well, uh, Coach is not so bad on Delta, man, is for sure. And investors right now liking the results from Delta, given the fact that the stock is up 3%, the best day in about three weeks, and at one point closer to a, uh, a month. And this, of course, on results that were better than expected, but it's really the outlook that folks like and the commentary about the future. CEO Ed Bastian saying that there is no let up in demand going into summer. Of course, summer being that all important travel season, business travel is very strong. So as a result, we do have the stock or excuse me, the adjusted profit the range, $2.20 to $2.50 per share. Uh, that is above uh, the 223 average. This is for the current year uh, going in again into the important summer travel season. And uh, one analyst at City saying that the results and the guide look very encouraging. And when you put this together with some of the recent travel scares that we have, investors encourage that stock again up 2.5% on the day, Manus. Okay, Abby, thank you very much. We're also watching the Boeing stock. Under pressure, again, a whistleblower claiming that the company took manufacturing shortcuts, this time on the 787 Dreamliner aircraft. Crady Greifeld is with me. I mean, this was quite a quite a piece of theater yesterday with a whistleblower, with lawyers, and a press conference. Absolutely, and the takeaway here is that there's still a long way to go when it comes to Boeing's recovery, made longer by what you were saying. Of course, that whistleblower alleging that the company took those manufacturing shortcuts on the 787. Remember, most of the scrutiny has been on the 737 MAX model. That, of course, was the aircraft involved in January's Alaska Air incident, but now that scrutiny extending to the 787 manufacturing process as well. And it's interesting. Of course, these allegations came on the same day that Boeing reported first quarter deliveries. And we learned that Boeing delivered uh, 83 aircraft in the quarter. That is the lowest tally since mid-2021. And of course, they delivered about 29 planes specifically in March. Now, you compare that to what we heard from Airbus. Boeing's rival delivered 142 aircraft in the first quarter, 63 handovers last month. So Boeing clearly falling behind here. And you can really see that in the show. As you take a look at Airbus, it's currently higher by about 18% year to date. You compare that to Boeing, it's down a little bit today, but down a whopping 32% so far in 2024, Manus. Katie, thank you very much. Stock down by a quarter of 1%. Turn our attention to tech. Alphabet impressing the street after unveiling a host of updates. You got it around AI and the offerings during its annual cloud conference. Ed Ludlow is with me. Did they impress? Uh, they impress, although the stock's down eight tenths of one percent. I'd say that in this post CPI market for technology stocks, that's relatively buoyant as things go. And it's worth noting the stock was higher in pre market by half percent. The sell side are really positive about what Google did. So much of the conversation we've had about AI or generative AI as a tool has been in the context of chatbots that are consumer facing. But the real battleground is the enterprise customer using generative AI through cloud platforms, a market in which Google Cloud Platform is a firm third place behind Amazon AWS um, and Microsoft's Azure. The real thing that the street is seizing on is their Google Cloud Platform's developers application, which is called Vertex AI. And in a demo that Google gave Bloomberg, they basically demonstrated how if you're a marketing firm, you can upload images, marketing related images to Google Drive. The generative AI or Gemini 1.5 Pro model then takes those images and you can basically ask it to do whatever you want. Make me a slideshow or a presentation based on those images. They also showed off cybersecurity use cases and other app development. And, and it's the first tangible sign that Google feels that the uh, model that they, they have out in, in the marketplace, Gemini Pro 1.5, is ready for real time. It's ready to be used in the enterprise use case. And across all of the sell side notes, there are many. If there's one commonality, it's that this will see Google accelerate its cloud growth and potentially continue to, to chip away at market share at the number one and two placed AWS and Microsoft Azure. But yeah, the stock down half a percent, as I say, in this post CPI tech market, that's buoyant. I think I'm right in saying that there's just one single or a couple of stocks in the green on the NASDAQ 100 anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's down a third of relative to the index. It's down a third on a relative basis to that. And thank you very much, Ed Ludlow, uh, in San Francisco. Let's turn our attention to China. Jack Ma applauds Alibaba's latest overhaul plan in a rare memo. That's after stepping away from the spotlight. Isabel Lee is with me. It's rare to hear from Jack Ma. What did he have to say?
where indeed Manus and he re-emerged from seclusion to boost the morale of his company, which is quite sagging. Jack Ma wrote in a lengthy post in Alibaba's internal forum that he's praising the efforts of the two new leaders of Alibaba, which is Eddie Wu and Joseph Tsai, and saying the company is on track. So to your point, this is rare because this is only the second time in the past few years that he has re-emerged from his seclusion. And the first time was four months ago. And this it was a reversal because in that uh, re-emergence, he was actually criticizing Alibaba and even praised uh, a rival. He said right now, though, it's the right time for the company. He reiterated calls to think outside the box and to escape from what he said is a, quote, big company trap. And recall that last year, Alibaba had this huge plans to restructure its sprawling empire into six little babas or baby babas. But that still has yet to pan out. Ma still looked up to by around 200,000 of his employees. So this is welcome news. Shares are up now at around 3%. In Hong Kong, it closed higher by 5% to the most in two months. So shares of Chinese stocks in Hong Kong has been really quite lackluster in the past month. But recently, it's been showing signs of re revival at the robust manufacturing data. And we have JP Morgan saying investors should consider using cheap options as a way to seize gains. Manus. Isabel, thank you very much, <laughs> baby Alibaba, uh, Alibaba's. Uh, and a hot CPI report. That is what we are dealing with here in March. Prices rise more than expected. And my next guest writes this. While investors want rate cuts, a strong labor market and Fed funds rate that is not too restrictive suggests the Fed may be on hold until the second half of 2024. That might get later and later. Let's see whether Megan Horneman is moving forward with later and less rate cuts post a hot CPI from Verdant's Capital Advisors. Megan, good morning. Later in less cuts? Yeah, absolutely, especially after the print today. I think a lot of people were talking about the first couple of months and those surprising numbers as being having some seasonal factors and maybe one-off um, situations. But we're seeing that now three months in a row with hotter than inflation numbers. And then some of the things, um, whether it's commodities, whether it's looking at the ISM manufacturing report that those prices paid jumped up, these are just showing that inflation is getting just becoming a very stubborn situation for the Fed. Well, it's also going to become a hot political potato. Housing and gasoline costs contribute to more than half the increase in the overall CPI. Uncomfort, or discomfort, one could say, in Capitol Hill as well? Yeah, and the problem is that the Federal Reserve really can't do anything to control either one of those. Um, that's going to have to come from some sort of fiscal policy or, or government um, change there. But the Federal Reserve can't control gasoline prices, and they can't control, they can't build houses, so they can't make home prices go down. I think it brings into question the, the potential of an SP or release. I mean, we're looking at gasoline prices mm -hmm. um, literally on, on a straight line higher. Let's reset for a moment. We've got a hot CPI, core CPI also rising. The three month it, it is skirting towards 5%. So we have hot inflation, and yet you are one of the first guests to really lean into the LEI, leading economic indicators, suggesting that there's some cracks in the economy. So I want you to bring, paint a picture for me on what that is. Wages we know are not ratcheting out of control. This is a broad-based broad spread in inflation. So where are the cracks? So when you look at that leading indicator index, this has been something that's been around for, for decades and decades, and it's typically always been a precursor to a recession. And what we've seen is we just finally got one month where I think it rose about a tenth for the month, but it's been consistently negative um, for a very long period of time, the longest it's ever been that hasn't led to a recession. So the cracks that we're seeing is that I think from Let's take a step back, first of all, and look at why we're getting a resurgence in economic growth here in the first quarter. A lot of it has to do with, unfortunately, the Federal Reserve giving some very conflicting messages. They came in in the fourth quarter of last year, and even though the unemployment rate was very low, inflation was not anywhere near where they wanted it to be, they got dovish. And they got dovish, and they even told us that there would be rate cuts this year without getting inflation to where they needed to be. Um, this caused an increase in consumer confidence, and this caused an increase in some of the economic activity. But underneath of the surface, consumers are extraordinarily strained. I think they're spending with the anticipation the Fed will cut rates, but we have credit card debt that's extraordinarily high. Um, we have delinquencies that are rising, not just in um, homes, but also in auto loans and credit cards. This is showing that the consumer is not as strong as the data points are showing. That's a concern. We haven't addressed commercial real estate. We haven't addressed the, the, the commodity market and how we're seeing that put even more strain on households. These are all things I think are just going to keep um, you know, a lot of pressure on the economy as, as we get into the second half of this year.
translate that into action for me in the portfolio because if, if it's as mm. if, if the headwinds are as stacking as, as you're suggesting and we're not paying enough attention to them do i lighten up on consumer cyclicals do i build up in defenses i've got gold running up higher that can come for any number of reasons whether it's central bank buying or perhaps more retail buying but the concerns you've just laid out most other people want to go pro risk it sounds like you want to go pro defense and we have been, we've, you know, the, we didn't participate in that whole AI driven momentum rally where we saw the valuations on the S&P 500 skyrocket to levels that we did not find justifiable, given the fact that we think the Fed rate cuts were way too optimistic for this year when we came in to 2024. So from a portfolio positioning, there's a couple things to do. First of all, make sure that you're in balance with um, your asset allocation. These, some of these tech stocks, some of this growth has run up so far and so fast that your portfolio portfolios may be overweight um, to those areas when you don't want it to be. Take some profits there. Um, there's nothing wrong with having a combination of both defensive stocks as well as cash. Um, the, the Fed is not, in our opinion, is not going to be making any moves anytime soon. There's no, there's no reason why you can't sit in 5% cash, um, wait for the market to pull back like we've starting to see this cracks in the markets recently, then look for the opportunities. Look at where those long-term opportunities are. We will get through this. We'll likely have a slowdown, if not recession. And when we come out of that, some of those areas that are beaten down that haven't participated in this rally, small, mid-cap stocks, these are some of the areas that tend to rally the most when you come out of an economic, economic downturn. Mm -hmm. And that's where we'll look to add some money. Well, if I look at the estimates for earnings, I mean, a lot of people have said the valuations are high. Don't worry, the earnings will catch up. You know, don't, you know, calm down. Stop being, stop being such a burr. Never met a, never met a wealthy, a, a wealthy, uh, a wealthy burr. But if I look at the Citigroup earnings estimates, I mean, we're seeing upgrades outpace downgrades. So I'm duty bound then to say to you, are, are the upgrades just too optimistic? Or how do you see the earnings season uh, at the start of 2024 panning out? We're, we're going into the banks this Friday. So the earnings expectation for this quarter, for first quarter 2024, um, there it, it's one of the slower quarters, but still positive earnings. Where we are concerned is that for the full year, uh, there was ex expectations for 10 to 15 percent earnings growth. And this is a year where there's a good chance the Fed's not going to be able to do much and the economy is going to slow down. So how does that translate into earnings? A lot of people are holding on to hope for this AI driven earnings boom. Well, we haven't really seen what AI is bringing to the earnings table yet from the broad market perspective. I think that, that there's going to be some concern in these earnings seasons that people are going to want to get um, paid for it or pay these extra. They're going to want some justification on why they pay these elevated multiples for these stocks. OK, Megan, let's see how the reporting season kicks off on Friday with the major banks. That is Megan Horniman, my guest this morning from Verdant's Capital Advisors. Coming up in the show, we are quite literally on the edge. We've got inflation topping out on the estimates for a third consecutive month on the core. Now, this is the curve to tens flattening, as you can see. There has been a virulent repricing, uh, pushing out rate cuts to November from September. And we briefly topped 4.5% on the 10-year government bonds. So there's been a major repricing on this. There you go. There's the pricing right now. Coming back from the highs very initially after the CPI print, up 11 basis points on the 10s now. Politics at play. President Biden responding to the data just moments ago. The details next from the White House on Bloomberg. What this says to the average CEO in this country is inflation is hot. Why am I not raising my prices? OK, I may be getting squeezed on my margins. I've got to get double digit earnings. I've got a tight labor market. Inflation is up. Other people are raising their prices. Why don't I just raise my prices? You know, and that becomes the self-fulfilling prophecy of creating the inflation environment. And this is where the rubber actually meets the road. Joining us now to continue that conversation on the latest CPI print, it is Bloomberg's Mike McKee. Mike, in the very first aftermath, we saw this very virulent bond reaction spiking higher. We're just coming off the highs of the day. As you dissect the data, is there any clarity around the driver of this spike? 
Well, the problem is, is there's a sort of broad-based increase in a lot of different categories, not very much for most. The biggest increases came in motor vehicle insurance, up 2.6 percent. It's up 22 percent on the year, and it's been rising for quite some time. The insurers say it's because it costs more to fix today's and more expensive uh, computerized cars. Uh, but that's something that monetary policy isn't going to be able to affect. We also see, saw a rise in energy prices, which the Fed can't affect. So uh, maybe there's a relationship with that in the markets. You can see in the, uh, in the graph uh, right there that uh, we have seen prices continue to rise. But on a year-over-year basis, what we're seeing is a stall in the monthly change and the year-over-year change in the CPI. Uh, so prices are going up. We're not making progress on bringing the rate of inflation down. And the Fed is going to look at that and say, well, higher for longer. They absolutely are, and that is reflected in perhaps the, the, the breadth trade today, the Russell 2000 under so much more pressure. Mike, thank you very much. And indeed, uh, the core are also rising on a three-month basis, closer to 5%. Let's talk about those sectors. Uh, who's taking the bruising this morning? Abby's with me as ever, side by side. Yeah, it's a pretty brutal day today, Manus, because we do have the S&P 500 down at this point, 1.2%. Off the lows of 1.5%, at that point, heading to the worst day since January. But not surprisingly, all 11 S&P 500 sectors are lower. The worst real estate down 3.6%. Now, this should not be surprising given the fact that yields are higher, so those dividends look less attractive. But in addition, the farther the higher rates stay, the more pressure that puts on the overall uh, real estate sector. Utilities also down 2.2%, high dividends there as well under pressure. And you can see that most sectors are sharply lower. Consumer staples even down 1%, healthcare down 1%, industrials, financials, consumer discretionary. So lots of pain on the day. We have haven't seen this in a while. Confirmation of this uh, hotter inflation data. Let's take another look at the real estate sector because if we uh, put it into the perspective of a chart, we're going to just see how painful this is. Down 1.5 percent over uh, the last three days. And of course, Manus, earlier this week, we did have the news Blackstone buying air communities for $10 billion. Lots of thinking there that that could open up the space, uh, a space that's largely expected to come under some pressure or even a crash because of rising rates. But now with this inflation print, it's probably going going to create a little bit of fear and uncertainty around what's next for commercial real estate offices in particular. Yep. Uh, and of course, we had that conversation with HSBC just a few weeks ago here in the studio and saying perhaps the worst is behind us on CRE. Abby, thank you. We've got a mirror image of what Abby has just talked you through in the Russell 2000. This is where the real pain trade is. If these rate cuts are later and less and emboldening the Waller and the Bostick narrative, then it is going to be those much more inflationary sensitive sectors, uh, as Abby had been saying. So this is reflected on the real estate and utilities, which she pointed out there. Real estate down 3.74%. The only thing in the green so far in this year on the Russell 2000, it's got to be said, is the energy component, which has outperformed uh, on a global basis. Let's dig a little bit deeper. The President of the United States has reacted to the latest inflation uh, data, writing this. I have a plan to lower costs for housing by building and renovating more than 2 million homes. And I'm calling on corporations, including grocery retailers, to use record profits to reduce prices. Will they? Enda Curran is with me. He is in Washington. And, uh, I mean, these policies which Joe Biden is espousing, he's not going to be able to build enough homes to materially change the housing component, the owner's equivalent rent, by November. And I've seen... Uh, retailers over the last 35 years rarely respond to missives in size from political capitals. Yeah, and, and time is running short from a policy viewpoint if you really want to turn around some of those big structural issues between now and the election, I mean, Manus. The other issue is that, you know, shelter... Uh, and gas made up half of the increases in inflation for sure, so the, the housing shortage is a big part of this. But it's also more broad-based than that, and that's probably the most worrying point for the politicians involved in this process. It's the, you know, it's the cost of furniture, it's the cost of clothing, in particular for women and children, it's the cost of going to see your doctor, it's the cost of education. Uh, that's not even to mention the cost of insuring your car or getting your car repaired. I mean, this is kind of pretty much across the board. Economists are now worried that inflation is starting to accelerate again. It was meant to be the year of disinflation. And on groceries, by the way, the president talks about groceries. Actually, the food price component is pretty good. Prices for baked goods, baked goods have fallen by the most they have since they uh, the began keeping records on that side of, of the CPI basket. 
And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, certainly uncontrollable issues for the president trying to impact from afar. Coming up, Market Moving Events has said your diary by on Bloomberg. You want to focus on the auction today for 10-year government bonds, $39 billion. What will the appetite be? Plus, Fed speak from Goolsby and Barkin post that CPI. Then we roll on to Thursday, the PPI and the jobless claims. Jobless claims are going to be critically important. And we have an ECB decision. Of course, Friday takes you to JP Morgan, Wells Fargo and City on the results trail for Q1. Countdown down to the open. That was it. The team will take you through the rest of the day.